How's everybody doing? Excited about life and being in class? I'm excited yes, about life. Yes, 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 this is good. Uh, you guys have been working hard. Go ahead and take Friday off. It's on me. If anyone gives you a hard time about it, just say, Kersey said we could have it off. So, um, all right. So, my plan was today to like spend a couple minutes doing apology, the apology stuff, and then moving on. But the first class, we ended up spending a lot more time just looking at this uh, dialogue, monologue. It's almost more of a monologue, isn't it, than a dialogue. Um, so we'll just look at this, and then we will shoot out of here and do other things, like take naps and stuff, right? Or I never appreciated naps until I was in college. And then it's like, oh, these are amazing. Because like little kids, you have to force them to take naps. But adults are like, any time I can get a nap, sign me up. It's a good thing. So what did you guys think of this piece of literature that we looked at? This, this story, I guess, maybe? What do you think? What are some thoughts about it? Yeah, Faith? He's very sassy. Sassy. That's a good way to put it. Why is he sassy? What? a good way, yes. Kind of condescending or provoking? A little bit. It's, it's bordering um, mocking, but in yeah. a way that kind of saves him from, from uh, anyone that's allowed to control him directly. And do you want to do that to people who have the power to kill you? Well, <laughs> do you want to poke and prod he kind of discusses that. a wild animal, right? Like, I know this... this bear is about to eat me, so I'm going to get a stick and poke at it, you know, rather than trying to get away. Okay, yeah. Well, what are some other impressions you guys have of this? Yeah. So, you know, how you're talking about he pokes and prods the jury, I agree that he does, but there's something really amazing about someone that's so unconcerned about his own life wants to continue what his mission was. Yeah. Even to death. Yeah, and this this is one of the character things that we see in here that is I think one of the reasons why this piece of <coughs> literature, right? This 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 dialogue monologue has survived this long and is one of the foundations of western literature, western civilization. Of course, all of Plato because he is the most important ancient philosopher at least, but this is one of his most read uh, works, right? And part of that is because it does force us into asking ourselves, am I the kind of person that would stand up to this, this threat? You know, like if I had to speak the truth, but I know that truth was gonna ultimately lead to my death, would I be willing to do it? How many of you guys think you would? Or would you kind of fold and say, oh, I'm sorry I said anything, just let me go, right? That, and that's a, that's a character test for, for all of us. And that's why we're supposed to see ourselves in this in, in a certain way. So as we look at this, I want to run through it and see what uh, Plato is doing in this. And so we know Socrates was a real person. A lot of these dialogues, we're not really 100% sure if these things really happen. Like in Credo and Mino, there's a couple of them coming up where it's just a conversation between two people. So who knows whether that really happened. But at this trial, how many people are at this trial? Like a couple? Was it 501? Yeah, that's the, only the jurors, right? So and there's also going to be people attending it. So they're... I mean, think of like the Psalm Center full. That's sort of what we're talking about. So it's a very public thing. And 500 of those people are the jury. How many 
people do we have in our juries, like in America? Anybody know? Like 12 sometimes, like if it's a, if it's a civil case. And I think different like criminal cases, I think those numbers vary, but it's always just a handful of people, um, you know, like can sit around this table, that's how many. And so 500 pe 501 people, that's, that's huge, isn't it? That's, that's kind of crazy to, to think about. So it's probably the case that this is pretty accurate because a lot of people witness this. So if he's making stuff up, they're going, no, 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 I was there. That didn't happen this way. So it's probably fairly accurate. And when we look at what's happening here, the way that Plato unfolds it is, or it unfolds in front of him, there's like these old charges. And a lot of these are rumors too. So not even really official charges. They're just sort of rumors about him. Have any of you guys ever had rumors about you, like in middle school or high school, like people say things about you? How do you defend against rumors? Can you? I mean, do you go to every person and say, I really didn't do that, go to that person, I really, it's, it's really hard to defend against rumors. Then we see there is an official charge, or the charges, two of them, and he cross-examines Miletus, who is the guy who is uh, sort of the prosecuting attorney. We could think of it that way. Uh, he's like the DA. He's the one who bringing the charges to him. And then, um, and then he makes these closing arguments, and this is where we get the jury's verdict, and then ultimately the sentence. And so he, he starts with these rumors, and this is where he starts talking about himself and his early life and how he went, somebody went to this this oracle who's kind of this prophet type thing, I guess we could say, and this oracle said, Socrates is the wisest person in Athens. And what does Socrates think when they say that he's the wisest person? Does he like, yeah, it makes sense to me. What does he think about being the wisest person? You think it's true? Yeah. Yeah, he's like, I'm not really sure if this is actually true. So he's, and it's hard to say because part of his motivation, it could be like, yeah, I know that already. Um, but he, he plays it as if he's saying, surely I can't be the wisest person in the world. I mean, that guy over there seems a lot smarter than me. So what does he do? He, and what he does is, is a good example because he doesn't say, hey, the gods say I'm the wisest person. Awesome, I'm the wisest person. He's like, okay. Well, I think that person might be, so I'm gonna go test the case and I'm gonna start asking him questions about stuff. And when he asks people you think are smart, what happened, are they smart? Are they really as smart as they seem? No, and then he goes to like artists and they seem wise. He says, well, they are wise, but it's just sort of this artistic flair or the, they're inspired to make great music. They don't really even know what it means. Like, <laughs> if you listen to like old interviews with Bob Dylan, you guys know Bob Dylan, the singer Bob Dylan? And it's interesting because like these people will ask him like, what does this line mean? What does that line mean? And he's like, I don't know. It's just, it came to mind. So I wrote it down and people, he's like, I don't even know what it means. I just am doing this. And so he says, they're wise, but not in a sense that they even really know what they're doing. Craftsmen are wise, but not in, in any sort of way. And so at the, at the bottom of the screen sheet, Socrates is wiser than others in that what I don't know, I don't think I know. Did we talk about the Dunning-Kruger effect last time, which is a cognitive bias where people tend to think that they're better at things than they really are. This is what's happening here. He's saying, I realize that even if I think I'm good at math or basketball or whatever, like I need to understand I'm probably not as good as I really think. And so I need to have a lower or a, maybe a more realistic opinion of myself. So he kind of starts off this way. And then um, he's going to address, as formally as we see anyway, these charges against him. And what are the charges against him? What's the first one? Do you remember? Corrupting the youth, corrupting the youth right? So I'm corrupting them. And the other has to do with what? The gods, yeah, so this, it's a little bit nebulous on, are you saying I don't believe in gods? Or are you saying 
I'm introducing new gods? Are you, like, I'm not worshiping the correct god? So that, that charge is a little bit confusing anyway. But it's this one that we see some interesting philosophical maneuvers by Socrates. And if you ever take, like, an official history or, like, history of philosophy or an official philosophy class, there's always going to be, if it's, um, you know, dealing fully with philosophy, there's a heavy emphasis on logic because that's all philosophy does is it's making arguments and those arguments are only convincing if they're logically sound. And two of the main type of arguments you can make are inductive and what's the other? It starts with D, deductive. And these are both ways of establishing an argument, making an argument. And what we see is actually Socrates uses both of these in addressing this first charge. So it's kind of cool. This, so this is why this works great as a, like an intro to philosophy uh, document, because we see an example of these, uh, these arguments going on here. And so inductive, if you're going to make an inductive, what you do is you start with conclusions, and you have a few of these conclusions, and then you come out with a general principle. Principle. Not principal, because a principal is at a high school, the principal is your pal, P A L, but if it's a principal, it's P L E. Huh? Uh huh, uh huh, all right. Dessert is two S's because it's super sweet. You ever get to, like, what's up between between a desert and a dessert? Dessert has two S's, super sweet. You learned something today. All right, so we'll call that good. Uh, so, inductive arguments. Um, you start with this idea of, of some conclusions, like if I'm, I'm in here doing stuff, the wind, like there's no windows or anything, and people are walking in and they've got raincoats with hoods on and they're soaking wet and a few people walk in with umbrellas. So like I make a conclusion, that person's wet, that person's wet, that person has an umbrella that's wet. So I'm, I'm looking at a bunch of conclusions. What's a general principle I might be able to make? It's raining, okay? And another thing about these is that the principle, it is not certain. Like, I can't be 100% certain of it, but an inductive argument is effective when it has a high probability, okay? So I'm not, it ha I have a, it's not proven to me that it's raining outside, but it seems very probable. And the more people who come in, the more probable it becomes. So if I'm making an inductive argument, I need to like make some pretty good conclusions here. So the first thing that we see Socrates doing is he's going to address this idea of um, do I corrupt the youth? Okay, am I corrupting the youth? So he needs to come up with some sort of conclusions and then come up with a general principle of it, it wouldn't make sense. And so what he does is he's going to give us an analogy. And what does he compare the youth to? What's he compare them to? Yeah. A couple things like horses or something. Yeah, horses. So okay, that's a kind of interesting. And so what what he what he's going to do is he's gonna ask Miletus, so you say I corrupt the youth. Yes. Okay, so I'm corrupting the youth. Are, are there people who help? Like, so I guess hurting, corrupting is bad. So the opposite is what, maybe helping the youth? So are, are there people who help the youth? Yeah, there are. Okay, so who are the people that, that help the youth? <laughs> What's he say? Well, the jurors, of course, right? The judges and the jurors is so he gets Melita's store pander a little bit. Like, how about these people? Do they help the youth? Well, yeah, these are great people. They help the youth, okay? All right, so these people help the youth. Um, how about other people in Athens? Do they help the youth? Yeah, they help the youth. Well, like some of them or all of them? All of them help the youth. And so Socrates is like, oh, well, this is sort of interesting then. So what you're saying is I am the only person who helps the youth or hurt, corrupts the youth. Is that what you're saying? Because yes, a, there's only one person of all Athens that corrupts the youth, and it's you. And so this is what he's going to attack, this idea that 
most people help and only one person corrupts. And he's going to take that and he's going to go, okay, well, let's look at an analogy of this. Um, let's say there's a horse up here, you know, around us, okay? Now, do all the people, so if there's 50 people in here and there's a horse that coming in, would we all be helping the horse? Like, because I don't know what to do with the horse. I, I guess you feed it oats or something. I don't really know. Like, I guess you ride a horse, you, but I have no idea how to take care of a horse. And so if it's like a bunch of people like me and there's a horse, am I going to generally help it or hurt it overall? I'm going to be hurting it. Like, I'm not that I'm destroying it or anything, but I don't know how to take care of a horse. And so is there a type of person who does know how to take care of a horse? Yeah, like, uh, you know, a farmer or a husband, right? That's an official name, a veterinarian or something. And so the amount of people who know how to care for horses is really small. There's only a few of them out there. And so what he's doing is he's coming up with like this analogy. So obviously, people are more complicated than horses. People are more valuable than horses. People are better than horses. So if this is true about horses, that most people hurt and only a very few people help, then that's also going to be true of the youth. Okay, so his general principle, so based on this analogy, these observations, he's saying, well, generally then, it's not true that only one person hurts and everybody helps. You see what, so has he proven that he's innocent? No, all he's done is he's raised this question of, wow, okay, so why is Miletus picking on Socrates? And he, he says this, doesn't he? So like, so why are you saying I'm the only one that hurts when there's, there may be three other people who hurt the people? Why is he picking on me? Well, it's because he's got a beef with me. He doesn't like me. Something's going on. And so he sort of is diverting the issue from corrupting the youth to saying, well, why is, why is he attacking me? And you almost see sort of, if you guys are familiar with the logical fallacy of the ad hominem, this is, this is where you attack a person. So when, you know, if, you know, building, so if you're, gonna, if you're gonna say something like building a border wall is bad, you know, like, so if you wanna make that argument, you might say, well, Trump's a moron. Is that a logical reason of why building a wall is bad? That Trump's a moron? It might be true he's a moron. But what you're doing is you're kind of diverting the issue to attacking a person. That's sort of what Socrates is doing here. And so he's established that, okay, there probably are more people than one that corrupt them. All right, so that's the inductive argument he makes. And then he's going to make a deductive argument here. And a deductive argument makes statements, like probably a few statements, and then it comes to a certain conclusion. And he tries this too. The, one of the most famous is, you see this all the time in, in, um, in logic statements or uh, philosophy uh, classes because this talks about Socrates. Okay, so it, you would say one, Socrates is a man the second statement I'm going to make is that all men are mortal. Is that is Socrates a man or was a man? Is that true? He's a man. All right. Yeah, he's a human. All men are mortal. Does that seem to be true? I mean, that, that seems logical that that's true. So therefore, what are we going to say? Socrates is what? Mortal. Mortal. So if that's true and that's true, this has to be true. This is, this is a certain conclusion of this. Um, and so we would say that this is a logically sound or a valid argument. And so Socrates is going to try the same thing, again, attacking this idea of, of I'm corrupting the youth. And so I was going to say, it's like, so my first statement is going to be this. Um, and sort of you see it, it written down here. Okay. So if I corrupt the youth, number one, if I corrupt the youth, I'm going to make them bad. Yeah, that's true. Like, so if I corrupt people, you're going to be a bad person. Number two, bad people make things bad for those associated with them. So if I'm corrupting you, I am making my life miserable, right? So if, if, you are, if I'm going to turn you into jerks 
what are you going to be to me? You're going to be a jerk. Well, that doesn't seem good, does it? So number three, corrupted associates <coughs> would make it bad for me. So if I'm corrupting you, you're going to be bad. You're going to make my life bad. Fourth, people don't intentionally make things bad for themselves. And you're like, yeah, that's, that's true. I get, you know, crazy people might, but logical, normal people aren't going to do that. So if those are true, therefore, what he's going to say is if I corrupt the youth, it's unintentional. Now, did he prove that he doesn't corrupt the youth? <laughs> no, he's saying, so even if I do corrupt the youth, it's by deductive logic, I'm not doing it intentionally. Because people don't corrupt other people intentionally because then they're going to make their life bad. So at worst, I'm doing it what? Unintentionally. Okay. So notice again, he hasn't proven that he doesn't corrupt the youth. He's saying, look, if I'm doing it, I'm doing it unintentionally. I, I didn't mean to do it. I'm doing something wrong. And if somebody's doing something unintentional, do you throw them in jail? Or what, what might be a better way? If, if somebody's doing something wrong, what, what's the kind thing to do to that person? What's that? Correct them, right? You pull them aside, say, hey, Socrates, dude, I know that you think this questioning stuff of people is really great, but you are really screwing these kids up. So could you not do that so much, right? And so, you know, you show them. So like, you're corrupting these people. I know you probably don't mean to do it, but you might want to stop doing it, okay? And so again, he hasn't proven that he's innocent. All he's done is said, look, if this is happening, I don't mean to be doing it. And so if I don't mean to be doing it, what you should be doing is, is setting me aside and say, you probably want to stop doing that, okay? You don't throw people in jail for making minor mistakes or for doing things that they didn't intend on doing. You, you give them a warning, right? You say, probably should slow down on that, all right? And then he has this question of the gods. And with that, it's, it's a different case. Uh, we see at the bottom of page one here, uh, nonetheless, tell us, Miletus, how you say that I corrupt the young, or is it obvious from your deposition that it is by teaching them not to believe in the gods? So in other words, like, these, it doesn't logically uphold that I'm corrupting them, like I have poles in that. So maybe it is this god thing. So is this not what you say I teach and so corrupt them? So it, it has to do with the gods. This is most certainly what I do say. So, Socrates, so you're saying I'm an atheist? Like, like I'm denying God? Is that what you're saying? Well, he says, yes, you are an atheist. Okay, so top page two. Um, so what you're saying is I don't believe in any gods? And Melita says, yes, you don't believe in any gods. He says, well, that's kind of weird because even in this discussion we have, I've talked about gods five or six times, and I talk about divine things. I talked about how I went to the oracle and how the oracle talked to me and how I believe in all these godly divine things. I talk about that all the time. It's like if you just listen to me for five minutes, you're going to hear me mention the, this god and that god. And I'm going to mention that I believe the gods are at work. So what he's saying, Socrates is guilty, so in 27a, Socrates is guilty of not believing in gods, but believing in gods. So in other words, it's black and it's not black. It's five and it's not five. So can something be true and false at the same time? No, it's, it's logically you can't, you can't be one thing and not one thing. So you say you're accusing me of gods. But like I talk about gods all the time. He has this great line. So like, can you believe in flute music? Like if, I, if I'm listening to guitar music and say I really like that guitar music, can I not believe in guitars if I like guitar music? No, I mean, you got to believe in guitars if you like guitar music. And you're going, yes, exactly. So I am not denying the gods. And so that logically doesn't hold up either. And so what we see happening at this point is that he is, whether he's given the greatest answers in the world to these charges, uh, may, maybe not, maybe so, but he's made compelling arguments anyway against these accusations to him. Should Socrates have st has stopped at this point? That he's made these, he's made these arguments. Should he just say, okay, now you 
figure out if I'm guilty or not. Should he have stopped? What do you think? Maybe, maybe not. I, I think it would have been smart for him at this point just to say, all right, you've accused me. I'm making arguments against it. Now you guys vote. But is this what Socrates does? Does he just leave it? Or does he start to provoke? <laughs> yeah, it's like, OK, so I made these arguments. And then he turns his attention to, like, from Miletus. He's making this cross-examination. And then he turns to the jurors and says, oh, by the way, jurors, I'm on a mission from God, and my mission is to show the common people how ignorant and unwise they are. And that includes you, OK? So then he goes on to rant for page after page about how his mission is to help people understand their ignorance. Now, is this a smart move if you're trying to argue for your life, that you turn around and you start provoking the person who, is, who has your life in their hands? Probably not, right? He, he probably just left it, but he does say, like, hey, God is leading me towards this kind of thing. This is my life. This is what I do in front of people. Okay, so I'm going to do it a little bit more. And it's probably not a smart thing to do because this could lead to my death. Um, and so in 29A, again, where he should have just said, okay, now go vote, he's going to say, oh, by the way, I've got something else to add here. To fear death, gentlemen, is no other than to think oneself wise when one is not. So do any of you guys fear death? Like, if, if you were told when you walk out this door, you're going to die, how would you, would you be like, eh, okay, whatever. Is there some fear that you might have? I fear the journey, not the destination. Like, okay. I'm scared what's going to happen, but I'm not scared of where I'm going. Okay, so there's some confidence on maybe, like, this will lead to something, like, I'll go to heaven or something, and that's good, right? Do you think it's common for people to fear death? Yeah, I mean, you're in war, all this kind of stuff. It's like, I don't, I don't want to die. And so what Socrates is saying is, logically, since you don't know what death is, we shouldn't fear it because who knows? It could be something good. We simply just don't know what it is. Um, and if you say that you do know, you're, you're pretending to know stuff that you can't possibly know. No one knows whether death may not be the greatest of all blessings for a man. Might be, who knows? Yet men fear it as if they knew that it is the greatest of the evils. So what he's saying is we don't know what happens at death. And I put this word ontology, but I want to circle that. I think we talked about this word when we um, started talking about philosophy. So ontology has to do with, um, essentially, it, it just means the being of something. So like what something is. So ontologically, this, this podium is what? What's this podium made of? Wood. Wood, right? So ontologically, this is wood. We can talk about wood. We can say, hey, this is a pine or whatever. It is. I don't know what it is. But we can like describe it in certain ways, like it weighs two pounds. It's you know three foot tall. It, so we can do a lot of describing ontologically about this thing. Is death like that? Do we know how much death weighs? Do we know what death looks like? Do we know what death leads to? Like we really, we don't know. Like it's, it's a mystery to us. Um, we have suspicions. But what he's saying here is we don't know what happens at death. But he's going to say, but I do know that it's always right to obey elder. Like if, if I'm given an order, I know that's right. And he believes he's been given an order from God to live this life of constantly examining, or having people examine their own lives. So he says, I'm going to, because I don't know what death brings, I'm not going to freak out about that. All I'm going to do is do what God has led me to do, and that is to provoke people and make them think about their life. So he goes on with this. Um, and this is a great move, what he does here in 30C. Be sure that if you kill the sort of man I say I am, you will not harm me more than what? Yourself. Yourselves. So he, he does his turn. Like, what is worse? Is it worse to die as an innocent person or to kill an innocent person? 
feel is worse. Yeah, it's, it's worse to kill an innocent person. Like, because if I die as an innocent person, I'm a victim. But if I go out and I find someone who's innocent and I kill them, that is on me, right? And so what he's saying is, hey, if you, if, if it's, if it might, it might be true that I actually am innocent, that I'm not corrupting people, I don't believe in the gods. And if you end up bringing an, a guilty charge and you lead me to death, you are, are sentencing yourself, not me. Is that pretty heavy? Yeah, and so are people going to take that seriously? Well, obviously not, because they do sentence him to death, right? And so they're, they're kind of calling his bluff, of like, no, we think you actually are guilty. Uh, down a little ways, be sure, men of Athens, that if I had long ago attempted to take part in politics, so in other words, like, hey, if you like talking so much, why aren't you just run for office? Uh, well, if I had done that, I should have died long ago and benefited neither you nor myself. Do not be angry with me for speaking the truth. No man will survive who, genu who genuinely opposes you or any. You might want to underline that phrase. No man will survive who genuinely opposes people. Like that's just a general, he says that if you oppose people, they are going to put you down one way or another. Um, other crowds and prevents the occurrence of many unjust and illegal happenings in the city. A man who really fights for justice must lead a private, not a public life, if he is to survive for even a short time. So in other words, I've been doing this in small groups because I know that anybody who challenges people, like to really examine their life, are you a just person? Do you know what wisdom is? What's going to happen to those people? Are they going to be elevated? No, they're going to be brought down. And we see this. This happens to Socrates. This happens to another person you might have heard about, uh, Jesus. Like if you may have asked Jesus in your heart, right? What happens to him? He, he starts challenging people with truth. What happens to him? He dies. he dies, doesn't he? We see this in, I mean, Gandhi in India, Martin Luther King Jr. Like all of these people stood up, they challenged the status quo, and the status quo, the crowds cannot let that kind of voice survive. And it has to bring them down some way. And so Sardis is simply saying, all I'm doing is I'm just standing up and speaking the truth, and anybody who speaks the truth is going to be challenged with death. I'm willing to face it. Um, 33C, uh, this is a good point. If I corrupt the youth, why don't they testify against me? This seems like a really logical thing. So you're saying I corrupt the youth. I've been doing this for a long time, 20, 30 years or whatever. So it would seem that if I'm corrupting the youth, there's going to be some corrupt youth around. That makes sense. Yeah. So he's, why aren't you bringing these people up here? <laughs> you know, the people who are now murderers and all this sort of stuff because I corrupted them. These should be, that should be your evidence. Say, look, these are people that, Socrates talked to when they were youth. They are now corrupted. Therefore, he corrupted them. But can they bring these people? No. In fact, it says, even here today, he even mentions Plato. Like, Plato's here. He's one of the people. Bring him up. Ask him if I corrupted him. They're going to say, no, he actually improved my life, right? So this is a good line of argument. They say he's guilty. Um, perhaps you are down a little ways on 37... On the other hand, if I say that it is the greatest good for a man to discuss virtue every day, so in other words, like, okay, I'm guilty, you're gonna say, send him away somewhere. I'm just gonna do the same thing. All I'm interested in is having people investigate themselves. Do they know what piety is? Do they know what wisdom is? Do they know what justice is? Like, that's my calling in life. Um, to discuss virtue every day, and those other things about which you hear me conversing and testifying myself and others, and underline this next phrase, put a circle around it, put an asterisk around it, highlight it, because this is the most famous saying of Socrates, is one everyone talks about, for the unexamined life is what? Not worth living. So if you are living a life that you aren't asking yourself questions, what is justice, what is truth, what is wisdom, what is noble, what is piety, 
what's he say about your life? It's not really worth living. You're just a drone. You're just like a lemming. You are just kind of walking through life. You know, it's like go to college, get married, have kids, retire, and move to Florida and die. It's like I'm, I'm just living out a script that someone else has put. I'm, but he says, no, if you, if you examine yourself, that is a life worth living. 38B, like, okay, so maybe if you don't kill me, these guys have money, they might pay you. Okay, so, and then it's at the very end, and they've said you're going to die. And this, I think I put one of these questions in the quiz of do these things sound familiar? So, 40E, if death is like this, I say it is an advantage for all eternity would have, would then seem to be no more than a single night. If, on the other hand, death is a change from here to another place, and what we are told is true about all who've died there, what greater blessing could there be, gentlemen, of the jury? So, did I ask this question about uh, Philippians 1? Like, do you see any similarities here? What, what do you guys think? Are there similarities? Am I just totally making that up? You're just totally making that up. What do you guys think? Yeah, Joseph? So, just to make sure I'm clear, um, Socrates, when did he live? It would have been about 500 years before Paul. Oh, 600 years, probably. Yeah. So, could it be, would Paul have read Plato? Yeah. yeah. It's like you think of what is the standard, you know, would most Americans, well, I guess we don't read that much anymore, do we? But like Mark Twain, like do we, yeah, it's like that's something everyone's going to read. Um, to Kill a Mockingbird, did you guys read that in high school, right? Like, so there are certain books like everybody reads. Would Paul have read Plato? Yeah. And for a lot of the New Testament, he's being arrested. He is on trial. What is he having to do most of his life? <laughs> he's making a defense, isn't he? In Philippians specifically, this is, a, this is one of the jail epistles where he is literally where Socrates was in most of these dialogues. He was making a defense for his life. Do you think there is a relationship with what Socrates says about death and what Paul says about death. Or is that saying the Holy Spirit wasn't involved in writing the New Testament? Could have been an influence? Yeah, Joseph? I think it's very possible that Paul was inspired by, um, by Socrates. Um, I wonder, though, like, they did kind of have some different purposes because Paul was writing to encourage some believers and Socrates was a little bit more arguing to the people yeah. trying to kill him. Yeah. So there could be, yeah, Cam, what do you think? Well, you, I, I was kind of just saying similar, and also it's just Paul's a lot more sure of his belief, where yeah. Socrates is just kind of like reasoning from the cultural view of death in a way. Like okay. If, if it's this, it's this, whatever. Like yeah, that. yeah. Faith, where are you going to? Socrates is kind of like, either way I'm good, while Paul's like, I'd like to go join me God, but I'm supposed to be here. So one's like, eh, the other's like, no, I know. But yeah, yeah, but we see that there's a similar thing going on here, right? Like, this would be bad, like, you're saying this is bad and this is good, but I'm saying, hey, I'm not really worried either way, because if I die, and if it's just like, I just evaporate into the cosmos, who really cares? But if it is this other world where I get to speak like with Thales and all these other philosophers, Homer, right? So if it's going to be with these guys, hey, that'll be cool because I can hang out with them, right? So it's this acknowledgement that you can't really torture me like you think you are because I'm not afraid of death because either way, I'm fine, okay? And, I th and there would have been a lot. Uh, you also pick this up in here where he says, now you were telling me to stop talking to the youth like this. But it is better for me to obey the gods than it is to obey man. Whoever see that in the New Testament, like in Acts, like almost the exact same phrase, where the officials are telling the apostles, stop doing all this stuff. And what do they say? It's better to serve God than man. When they tell Socrates to stop, what are they saying? It's better to serve God than man. Is there an influence here? Like, 
there could be. These are cultural artifacts, right? So if somebody, like in a, in a, uh, in a sermon, if someone says, may the Holy Spirit be with you, you might think, that kind of sounds like may the force be with you, right? And that's, like, I know what that means. Like, may this thing be with you and guide you through life. And so you can say a very Christian thing by borrowing on this, like, secular artifact, right? And so... These would have been just ways of him communicating. Like, Paul would have been thinking about this because he would have been very well versed in, in this piece of literature. Um, and another thing we see um, in 41E, uh, this much I ask, um, when my sons grow, have grown, avenge yourself, blah, blah, blah. Um, or, at the very end there, or if they think they are something when they are nothing. In Galatians, he uses this phrase. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. So when the people, when the Galatians are reading this, because they would have been really well uh, versed in Socrates, and this specifically, they would have recognized that phrase. That, that's, that's like a, a euphemism that they would have understood. When people think they're nothing, something, but they're nothing, right? And so they would have been used to that, that sort of cadence. And so... I think it's, I find there are a ton of analogies that, that Paul very likely borrowed from, from this, from this work. And does it mean that it's divine? It's like from God? Well, it's just language. It's just like things that we understand that we sort of have in common, okay? So I want to end with like two lessons here. That it always end with lessons, kind of like veggie tales, right? Like you have to end with a lesson. So these would be good things maybe to test on. I don't know. So one, the first lesson to take away from this is to ask ourselves, um, are, are you fitting in or are you standing out? So in other words, are you part of the crowd? Are you part of the jury that's like the mass of people that's, that's doing the judging? Or are you willing to be someone like Socrates who stands up for truth even when it might cost you? And, and it's hard to do that because you know that if I stand up and I say this thing, I'm going to get ostracized. People are going to make fun of me. It's not popular, I'm not gonna be cool, or whatever. Um, you know, am I willing to make a stand and say, this is what I believe, and this is, this is the ground I'm gonna, I'm gonna die on, right? I don't care what the results are. And so that's, that's kind of a really powerful thing we see from him. And the other is this idea of, do you fear death? You feel like there's a healthy way, right? Like, I don't wanna, invite death, but are you living your life in such a safe way that you're avoiding death, right? Or are you willing to live a life where this could cost me? It's kind of cool that this is like the missions week and people, I mean, missionaries are saying, you know, you might want to go to this place and it's, is mission safe? Like, is it safe to go to a lot of these places? No. Does the Bible seem to be concerned about safety? Not really. There, there's, couple of great stories. The first one, uh, in church history, there was this guy named Tertullian. He was like second century uh, AD. He's a church father. And there's a lot of persecution happening in the church, and people are writing to Tertullian and saying, hey, if we do this, they're going to kill us. If we do this, they're going to kill us. If we go here, they're going to kill us. And what do we do? And Tertullian just wrote back this really simple thing. It's just, he said, must you live? So in other words, like, okay, so you're going to die. All right, so what's the problem with that? You're going to die. God's called you to die, so you die. Like, wow, I didn't expect that. And there's a, have any of you guys seen Band of Brothers, the, that episode? It's about World War II, this group of people. And one of the episodes, there's, like, the Americans are trying to get into this German village because this is where they have a lot of their, you know, the Germans have a lot of arms here and stuff, so they got to get in this village, got to take it over. And there's really bad leadership. And so they get about halfway there, and the Germans are just annihil just picking them off one after the other, and they just kind of freeze. Because the guy who's supposed to be leading doesn't know what to do. He's afraid. He just kind of freezes, like, I don't know what to do. All these people are getting killed. 
And so they bring in this other leader, uh, Colonel Spears, and who was like a real person. Colonel Spears was a real person. And so they ask him to leave. And he just walked right up into the village, like with his machine gun, and he just starts shooting people. And the Germans are like, don't know what to do. It's like, is, is he really doing this? And just like single-handedly, he walks in his village, takes all the bad guys, like just leads them into victory. And like none of the Americans get killed and he just does this really brave, amazing thing. And he's done a lot of stuff like this. And at the end of that episode, this, this sergeant comes up and he asks him like, how, how did you do that? Like you, are, you do such brave, amazing things. Why can't we do it? And he says the problem, the reason you guys aren't doing brave things <clears throat> is because you still think you have a chance of coming out of this alive. And as long as you think you have a chance of coming out of this alive, you're going to try to protect yourself. Because I decided the first day I was here, I'm dead. And so if I die, I die. Because I, I expect that's what's going to happen. He says, and when you have that attitude, then you're willing to go into, into these sort of situations where you face certain death. And who knows, maybe you might make it out alive. And he actually does survive the, the war. But that's a quite, you know, Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. Like, that's a really heavy statement. Because what happens when you take up your cross? Is that like you take up your cross and you put it down, go on vacation, and you pick it up again, and like, okay, I'm going to carry it for a while, and I'm going to put it down, I'm going to go to Disneyland, and I'm going to... No, it's like when you pick up your cross, that's the last thing you do. You don't do anything else after that. And that defines you. It's like when I'm carrying a cross, I am a cross bearer, and that's my, the rest of my life, which might not be very long. And so when Jesus says that, it's like, okay, when you take up your cross, your, your life is over. So when I ask you to do things that might cost you your death and ask you to stand out rather than fitting in, we need to be willing to do that. And what's amazing is we have this pagan, Socrates, <laughs> modeling this for us, right? And so his, his bravery has been seen by a lot of people as really encouraging and has, has really helped a lot of people kind of live a virtuous life, right? Are your brains full? Yes. yes. What's that? The yeah, well, a lot of people say that. A lot of people will say that even though he didn't know the gospel, he knew enough about God to say a lot of true stuff. And so a lot of the early church fathers will say that it was God speaking to him, even though he couldn't recognize it because he didn't have the Bible or the gospel. But there's a lot of people who say that it, it could very well be the God that we worship who was communicating to him because he says so many true things. Yeah. So we'll find out when we get to heaven, right? Is Socrates here? We will look for him. And you look for me, I probably won't be there either. So, yeah. So, all right, guys. See you on Monday. Have a good weekend. <laughs>